Okay, with that, I'm going to introduce Timothy Searchinger. He's a research scholar at Princeton University. His special field is the interaction of greenhouse gases and food supply. And the stairs are on the other side, unfortunately. So. Well, good morning. Um, I, uh, I come to you as essentially the agriculture department at Princeton, so it's a pleasure to come to a university with a real agriculture department. And my field is how do we feed the world without destroying it? And in fact, the population is likely to grow to uh, 9.8 billion people by uh, 2050. And we've just put out, uh, I've just put out a report with the World Bank, the World Resources Institute, lots of other organizations, essentially on how you might actually do that. How might you feed the world by 2050 without uh, destroying it, with acceptable greenhouse gas emissions, without converting more land. And I, uh, we have a synthesis report that you can see the site to, and there'll be about a 500-page version of that coming out in May, June. But, the, but all the highlights are there. And we start with the fact that agriculture occupies about half of the world's vegetated land. And that occupation by itself uh, is the largest source of biodiversity loss. Uh, agriculture uses about 85 to 90 percent of all the world's water, depending on how you count, of water withdrawals, depending on how you count it. And agriculture is a source of about uh, 25 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. A little less than half of that is due to land use change, uh, which is, sorry, uh, uh, which is from the, I think I, I, I jumped slides a bit, uh, but a little less than half of that is from land use change, from converting forests and the ongoing degradation of peatlands, and a little bit more than half of that is from the production process. And while people think that the production, the emissions from agriculture, some people think that the emissions from agriculture are mainly in the form of energy use, that's not true. That's a, that is a role. We get emissions from energy use and on-farm and from the production of inputs, particularly fertilizer. But the vast majority of the production emissions come from nitrous oxide and methane that are produced in various parts of the process of producing agriculture, and I'll come back to those. So what's the challenge? The challenge is despite this uh, difficult condition we already have, is we need to produce more than 50% more food by 2050, at least using 2010 as the starting point. And uh, the reason for that is partially population growth. In 2010, the population was around 7 a billion. It's going to go up now close to 10 billion uh, by 2050. And it's partially because uh, as people incru increase their incomes, they eat more resource-intensive foods, primarily meat and milk, but even actually shifting from grain to vegetable oil takes more resources. Now, we estimated using a new model uh, that more or less if we just maintain existing rates of uh, historical rates of yield growth, including on pasture, that we'll still need to convert almost 600 million more hectares of land. That's about uh, an area almost three quarters of the continental United States. And uh, that would have enormous consequences for biodiversity. That land would have to come from f uh, forests and savannas, and about 400 million hectares of that is pasture, by the way. And I'm going to keep coming back to that. The role of pasture, the role of livestock, is a huge part of this story. Pasture occupies two-thirds of the world's agricultural land, and while we think of that as mostly kind of native, drier pasture, in fact, 40% of the world's grazing land actually was originally forest. And that's where most of the food comes from. And you can see this, and we're going to have, in fact, the projections are for almost a 90% increase in ruminant meat. That's cattle, that's sheep and goats, and uh, almost a 70% increase in dairy. And that 
given the fact that we're already using this massive amount of, of converted forest for grazing and most of the food, most of the feed, comes from grasses for ruminants, that's a big land use challenge. And in fact, that's not just where it ends. Uh, it, we're probably going to need more land for urban expansion. We're going to need more land for forest plantations. And the reason this is a very big deal is, of course, that converting, of, not just for habitat, but converting land uh, releases carbon, right? Vegetation is 50% carbon. You lose typically about a quarter of the carbon in the top meter of soils uh, uh, when you convert agricultural land. And the key thing to know is that every strategy for stabilizing the climate at an acceptable temperature essentially assumes that we have no land conversion between now and 2050 on a net basis. So the pattern is, the path is we're going to have hundreds of millions of hectares of land conversion even if we maintain historic rates of yield growth. And yet, uh, we can't do that um, if we want to stabilize the climate. Now, we also project that partially because of this land conversion and partially because of just you're producing more food, we're also going to get a large increase in greenhouse gas emissions. And I want to spend a little time on this, oh shoot, I want to spend a little time on this slide to explain this. So right now, uh, global emissions are around 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And about 12 of those, a quarter or so, come from agriculture. By 2050, we're projecting that agriculture would emit about 15 gigatons. About six gigatons per year would come from land use change, and about nine would come from production processes. Now, to stabilize the climate in 2050, the largest number of people are now using uh, is that total human emissions would have to be around 21 gigatons. And what that means, from energy, from, uh, from uh, cement, from agriculture, all these other sources, and what that means is that agriculture alone would emit about 70% of all allowable human emissions. And just to give you an idea, agriculture would be about 2% of global gross domestic product. So you can't solve climate change if a sector of the economy that produces 2% of the economic output generates 70% of your allowable emissions. And for agriculture to do its fair share, it has to be down at four gigatons. So basically what that means is we need to present, uh, produce more than 50% more food while reducing existing greenhouse gas emissions by two-thirds. So that is a big whopping challenge. And if we don't, we will cook the planet. So, can we do it? I don't expect you to study this slide completely, but we basically came up with what we call a five-course, 23-menu item solution. <laughs> and if you do everything right, we think the answer is yes. Everything right includes some technological innovations, which I'll, I'll come back to, because um, that is an important part of the subject. And you're a lot of people here from uh, ag schools, and so you should like this presentation because it means your work is a big deal. But it's interesting because in the energy sector, everybody knows that solving climate change means innovations, right? New energy systems. In the agriculture space, people sometimes talk about kind of yield gain and the importance of that and the research role for that, but actually coming up with improved production methods and all kinds of other uh, research and innovations are equally critical in the agricultural space as they are in the energy space. So here are the five courses. And uh, you can read them up there. I'm going to go through just three of them. Uh, and one is reducing the growth and demand. Now, by the way, uh, the answer to the last to the poll question was, you're both right, but let me explain why. Technically, we could feed the world today with existing food production on two conditions. Completely equitable distribution of all the world's food to every person, 
and we stop eating all animal products. All animal products. So nobody eats animal products. Uh, so that's not going to happen. Uh, in fact, it's a common mantra. People say, oh, we just need to redistribute the world's food and somehow or other we'll all be okay. Well, you know, we could, if we just said, well, we could just redistribute all the world's housing or all the world's transportation, then everyone would also be okay. But just because you want that to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. So the way you redistribute food is by doing specific things to hold down the demand of the wealthy. So that's how you do it. You don't just say, by the way, take that, you know, that, that, that bran muffin, take it, cut it in half and send the half of it to, uh, to India or Africa, right? You got to find ways to do it. So I'm going to talk about that because that plays an important role. So there are four main items in terms of holding down the growth and demand. Diets, food loss and waste, fertility rates, particularly in Africa, and bioenergy. Now, I'm going to talk very briefly about just two, because the conference is going to talk about them. One is food loss and waste. And you probably all know there are figures that a third of the world's food is lost or wasted somewhere along the way. It's about 25% best estimates of the world's calories. But this very, very rough figure, and probably some of that food is actually used for animal feed, uh, and it is very important. Now, the one thing we seem to uh, be confident of is that in the U.S., the food loss and waste is, off the, is really huge, and mainly at the consumer stage. So one thing Americans can do is waste less food, uh, and that's a big deal. But, um, and, and then when you get into uh, to Africa, most of the food loss and waste uh, occurs uh, actually during the processing or harvesting part of the process. So as Africa develops, it will probably lose less food in this stage, but it may waste more food at the consumption stage. Um, so we focus on this, but it's often used as kind of a magic asterisk. It's not easy to reduce food loss and waste. Why? Because it is actually, that occurs over five steps of the process. No one person is losing 25% of the food. You might be losing 5% of the food. So to cut that food loss and waste in half, people who are now only losing 5% of the food have to only lose 2.5% of the food. And that's not easy. And that, again, is going to take some technological innovations to make that possible. But, but on a behavioral standpoint, Americans are the worst. You know, you go to Costco, you throw the food in the refrigerator, you can't, you can't find it. It's too big, it's in the back, and you end up throwing a lot of it. Sorry? It's, it's usually uh, un, uh, unharvested food or food that's badly harvested. That's basic. Because things ripen unevenly, for example. Can you get questions from the audience? Oh, okay. I'll do it next time. Okay, then very quickly, uh, people talk about population growth. The, the population story is basically this. In the vast majority of the world, fertility rates are already very close to replacement levels or below replacement levels and are going that way. We're going to get about a billion more people in Asia, not because they have a lot of children today, but because they used to have a lot of children and as they age. And short of killing children, you're not going to reduce that population. Uh, however, Africa is a special exception, and it still has fertility rates over five. And its population is going to go, sub-Saharan Africa is going to go from about 900 million to over 2 billion by 2050. And the good news is that uh, you don't actually have to be rich. A country doesn't have to be rich to reduce its fertility rates. Every country in the world of every culture reduces its fertility rates on if three things happen. One, you educate girls into lower high school. Two, you keep babies alive so people don't overcompensate by having more babies. And three, you provide access to family planning. And you can see basically all the red is Africa is behind on all of these things. So there is a, Africa is kind of the epicenter of this challenge because of the population growth and its low yields. And there is a, however, all of these things are things that should happen anyway. And I kind of come back to that. Most of the things that we want to do to solve Climate change are things that would be good in and of themselves, right? Educating girls, giving people a choice, keeping babies alive, right? 
And there are countries that have, in fact, reduced their fertility rates extremely quickly in, over, in just 20 year periods. But now, I, this is what I really want to talk about is diets. So, um, actually, uh, I thought I had, no, okay, I lost that one. Um, the emissions associated with meat and the land use associated with meat are off the charts higher than plant-based products. But particularly beef. Beef, sheep, and goat meat. And the emissions associated with those and the land use requirements are about 10 times that even of beef and pork. And dairy is a little more than beef and pork, but not as bad as beef. Why is that? Because it takes a huge amount of feed to maintain one, uh, uh, to produce one cow. Uh, relative to the conversion ratio, only one to 2% of the calories in come out in the form of food. And also because they produce a lot of methane in their stomachs, which we'll talk about. So the emissions are off the charts, and this is the emissions from the average US diet. And the red is basically the beef. And beef is about half of the emissions. It's about almost half of the land use, and it's 3% of the calories. So uh, if you were to reduce consumption in the US diet by about 50% of the beef, you can dramatically reduce the land use demands and the production emissions. Uh, and actually, these are the emissions that when you account for land use as well, and I want to come back to that, beef is off the charts, uh, more resource intensive, more uh, polluting, even though it produces so little food. Now, this is a new paper I had out in Nature in December. And what I want you to focus on, this is the average European's diet. And what we're estimating is the greenhouse gas emissions of that are around nine gigatons. Now, if you were in the climate business, you'd go, what? Because nine gigatons is the typical estimate of the greenhouse gas emissions of the average European's consumption of everything. All energy, all cement, everything. And here it is, we're claiming that actually the diet alone, the greenhouse gas consequences of the diet, just what people eat, is the equivalent of the emissions of everything else combined. Why is that? What is that reason our answer is different? And the answer is that most estimates of the greenhouse gas consequences of food production don't count emissions from all existing agricultural land. They treat the land use cost, the, and here are the land use cost, right? Any hectare of land that isn't producing food could be storing carbon in the form of savannas, natural vegetation, forests, and they ignore the cost, the loss of the carbon storage that we use to, uh, that we have to convert that land uh, uh, to food production. They count new conversion every year, but not all of the conversion on existing agricultural land. Which is a way of saying that, uh, I can go into more complication of questions, but it's basically if we, if the average uh, American uses a hectare of land globally to produce the, uh, his food or her food, but you're not converting new land, that hectare is viewed as carbon-free asset. You don't lose anything to use that hectare. But that hectare can store a lot of carbon. And in fact, each person's additional consumption means we convert more land by that hectare because we're expanding land each year. If you changed your diet so you only consumed half a hectare, you'd save half a hectare of conversion. And when you factor in that opportunity cost, that potential to store carbon on land if not used for food production, it turns out to be a huge number. And this is an important theme that our discussion of diets, of greenhouse gas emissions, has tended to assume that, f that land, highly productive land, is of no value or of little value. It's extremely valuable. And one way to think about it is this. If we need to produce 50% more food and we need to store more carbon on land and forests and otherwise, 
the but land area is fixed. The only way you can do that is to make more efficient use of land. Every hectare of land has a valuable opportunity cost. And we've been ignoring that opportunity cost. So we focus on beef consumption because it turns out that, um, so these, this is the consumption of beef. And globally, the blue is the existing consumption and the yellow is with the added consumption that the Food and Agriculture Organization estimates will be consumed in 2050 by each person. And what you'll see is that actually beef, uh, not just beef, but ruminant meat, it's only about two billion people, even in 2050, are gonna consume large quantities of beef and lamb and, and goat meat. And what we discovered is if even, if those two billion people consume on average 50% less, so if the average American consumed 50% less beef than he or she does today, we could uh, cut the gap, the greenhouse gas gap, remember we have to reduce these emissions by 11 gigatons from 15 to four, we could cut that gap in half and we could almost eliminate net land use change. But we, we're not a big believer in just uh, the ability to, cons to reduce all uh, consumption of animal foods, animal-based foods. And the reason for that is that even in 2050, about six billion people will consume about half or less of the animal products we consume today, which is significantly less than the animal products even consumed by a vegetarian in the United States today. And if these people are going to have room to consume even a little bit more animal products, then we, we have to reduce somewhat. But that's not going to save things globally. So the lesson for this is Americans have to consume some fewer animal products, but above all, less beef. Now, we think that's feasible. And the reason it's feasible is the typical American consumes a third less beef uh, than that person did in the 1960s already, partially shifting to... to, to um, uh, to chicken, that's been the main thing, but also because plant-based foods are getting, plant-based meat foods are getting good. So this is a really big deal. Now the other thing we have to not do is produce bioenergy. So there are targets, bioenergy of course is energy from plants, and there are lots of people who throw around numbers that we should have about 20% of global energy from bioenergy in 2050. How much of the world's harvested plant material would you have to use to provide 20% of the world's energy in 2050? The answer is all of it. All the world's crops, all the world's grass eaten by livestock, all the world's crop residues that are harvested, and all the world's uh, wood harvest. If you just wanted to do it through wood, you'd have to increase almost tenfold just the harvest of wood, just to produce that. And so people who are throwing around these numbers have no perception of what they're talking about in terms of the global impacts, including the carbon losses. Now, there's a highly technical reason for why you need so much plant material to produce bioenergy. And the technical reason is that photosynthesis sucks. So, but for photosynthesis, none of us would be here. We wouldn't have this nice breakfast. We wouldn't have forests. In that sense, we need photosynthesis. But as an energy conversion, it's really bad. So to give you some idea, the most efficient bioenergy in the world today is sugarcane ethanol. And it converts 0.2% of the energy in the sun into ethanol, into the energy in ethanol. And in the, for those people who talk about energy uh, crops, in the most optimistic scenario, you get up to 0.35%. And a PV cell today will give you 20% and a net of 15%. And here's the other thing. To produce these things, you need to compete for the world's best agricultural land or forest land. To produce solar energy, you can use dry land. So bioenergy requires huge amounts of highly productive land to produce small amounts of energy, and we can't afford it. We, it isn't, we, we simply couldn't. If with any kind of meaningful amount of bioenergy, 
uh, we will not be able to solve the, the food and forest crisis, let's put it that way. And in fact, on 75% of the world's land, you could produce at least 100 times more usable energy using solar today as bioenergy optimistically in the future. Which means if you had 100 hectares of spare land and you used one for solar cells and reforested 99, you'd get 100 times more greenhouse gas benefit in the same amount of energy. Uh, I'll come back to that because uh, the explanation for that may be later because I'm going to run out of time. But the second course is making more food in the same land. Duh, right? If you want to produce 50% more food and you want to do it without converting forest, you got to produce 50% more food on the same land. <laughs> so that means productivity gains are a really big deal. Now to give you some idea of this, we actually have these huge productivity gains built into our 2050 baseline. So without, if you try to produce all the food in 2050 with today's production systems, you would have to convert more than 3 billion hectares of land. It means you basically wouldn't have a forest left in the tropics or the temperate world. The greenhouse gas emissions that would cause would be over 30 gigatons which means you'd be more than 50% more than the allowable limit from all human sources. So fortunately, we assume large projected yields, which are even higher than the kind of recent trend lines. And what it shows you is that productivity gains matter a lot. They also, productivity gains also reduce uh, uh, production emissions. These are the production emissions, which I'll go into. But it turns out productivity gains mean, in this context, more food for the same amount of inputs. More food per hectare, more food per unit of fertilizer, more food per animal, more food per unit of energy. I'll, 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 I'll want to take questions later, yeah. So productivity gains are, that we build into our baseline are already doing most of the job compared to the alternative of, of what you would do if you had none. So it's hard, it means we need to do even better than we've done in the past. And I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. One reason the land use challenge has been underestimated is that you tend to get people saying we can use a category of land called other. What the hell is other? Other turns out to be anything that's not agricultural land or forest, which basically means woody savannas, which are enormously biologically diverse and actually store a lot of carbon. And the World Bank at one point put out a report saying let's convert an area of woody savannas in Africa that are the equivalent to the entire continental United States. And we did a paper in Nature Climate Change showing that even from a carbon standpoint, forget about the biodiversity, even from a carbon standpoint, that would have enormous consequences. So what do we do? How, what is this? So one thing is we can't have to leave no farmer behind. So a lot of food is going to be produced by small farmers. And in fact, in Asia, small farmers achieve the same yields as large farmers. And women, in particular, tend to be denied resources for farming. They produce a, uh, provide a lot of the farming uh, uh, effort and labor. Now, we don't want to sentimentalize this. No one wants to be a subsistence farmer. Uh, if you're a subsistence farmer, you're going to be poor. And people are going to shift out of agriculture over time. But that doesn't mean that from a, both a, a, a social welfare standpoint and a production standpoint, you don't need to pay attention to boosting the productivity of small farmers. Uh, the other thing is crop breeding. Now, one of the things that's happened in the seven years we've been writing our report is the entire CRISPR revolution has occurred. And there are enormous new opportunities for uh, uh, breeding through all the advances in molecular biology that I won't uh, go into. We spend remarkably little money on crop breeding globally. Prob total ag research is only $32 billion globally. Uh, and um, so one thing we need to do is invest in conventional crop breeding and using modern molecular biological techniques. But a big, big part of this is better grazing, right? So we need to produce more or less 80% more food on grazing land. And that means improved grazing practices, and that means treating land with respect. The reason grazing land is undermanaged is because it's a cheap thing to do. You just cut down some forest and throw some 
some animals on it. And that is cheap if you don't count all the environmental effects of cutting down the forest, including the carbon. And so I spent a lot of time doing projects to try to increase the productivity of grazing land uh, around the world, which I consider one of the three major items to actually <laughs> feeding the, <laughs> solving this, this, this challenge. Uh, and it turns out that one of the things, if you feed animals better, is you produce a lot fewer production emissions. This is the methane above all produced in animals. And what you can see, this is a map of the greenhouse gas emissions that are produced for beef in different parts of the world. And there's a factor of 300 difference. So you can actually, there are parts of the world who, for each kilogram of beef, you produce more than three, or you produce 300 times the emissions that you do in the most efficient places. Okay. Last, a big topic I want to address is something that most people don't fully understand, which is that even though it is critical to uh, boost productivity on existing land, that by itself won't be enough. Why is that? Well, the big, a big reason is that land actually is shifting. So for every, more or less, for every two hectares of forests that are cut down in the world, one hectare is reforesting somewhere in the world from abandoned agricultural land. And some of that is occurring in uh, land shifting from Europe uh, to Latin America, for example, and Africa. Uh, and some of that is actually occurring even in developing countries. The blue is the reforestation, the red is the deforestation. And it, generally speaking, you're shifting from less productive, more slopey, drier lands into more productive, more carbon-rich forests. So this has a couple of consequences. One is that abandoned agricultural land is not free to use for another purpose, like bioenergy. The reforestation of abandoned agricultural land is critical, or otherwise we'd have twice as much forest loss, right? But it's not an equal deal. The carbon that we lose is immediate and higher per unit of food when we clear new land and where we're clearing new land than the carbon that we gain. And the biodiversity effects are much harder. So actually, avoiding the shifting of agricultural land is a big, big part of the challenge. And this is where you get into the, what I call the wicked problem. So mathematically, if we don't produce 50% more food in the same land, we're going to clear a lot of forest. Duh. But when you boost productivity in many countries, they become more competitive globally in supplying that product. So Brazil learned how to grow soybeans like crazy, and that actually, so they get almost the same yields as in the US. That did not hold down the amount of soybeans in Brazil. That expanded the amount of soybeans in Brazil because now they become a big global supplier. You're probably familiar with the massive loss of forests to produce oil palm in Indonesia and Malaysia. If people had never figured out how to grow oil palm at high yields, you wouldn't have cleared millions and millions of hectares of, of forest. So this is a wicked problem because you need to boost the yields, but then you need to use those yield gains not to convert forest, even though people now have an economic self-interest to convert more forests in some of these countries. And the only possible way to solve that problem is to, uh, is to link, well, let me go back, is to link the two. So international aid programs, uh, the efforts of companies working with farmers to boost yields, need to link in explicit ways, and countries need to link their assistance to boost yields with better protections of forests from converting land. And how we pull that off is a huge challenge. There are little examples of that kind of in Brazil when they've had some success. But another key point is if you keep building roads through forests, people are going to convert a lot of land because it becomes easy and cheap in access. And there are gigantic road building projects all over the world that if they go through, we can't solve this problem. So you need to actually plan where the roads are going to go and where the, where the road improvements are so you don't, wherever possible, convert more forest. And the one last thing I want to mention on this is, uh, so then, if some of you follow climate change, you're probably aware that strategies, there was, the IPCC put out a big report saying, by the way, it's a big deal 
even if we go, the difference between going to two degrees warming versus 1.5 degrees warming. Huge deal. To get to 1.5 degrees, you not only have to do everything I've said, but you would have to have restore hundreds of millions of hectares of forest, which means you have to have to shrink agricultural land. And people put out these reports talking about the capacity to do that without talking about the agricultural part. So if you want to, if you want to go to 1.5 degrees, it means that everything I've just said has to be done even more. Now we, in our breakthrough technology scenario, we can do that, right? If you reduce food loss and waste by 25%, if you shift beef consumption, if you increase yields as much as we think it's possible to increase yields, we can get to the point where we could actually restore five or 600 million hectares. But you can't do that until you've done that, right? However, there are some exceptions. So there is a tiny category of land in the world, which are peatlands, uh, uh, that are drained and used for agriculture. And peatlands are very carbon-rich lands because uh, the carbon couldn't be emitted by microorganisms because they're so wet. The richest carbon peatlands are in Southeast Asia tropical peatlands. And about uh, 26 million hectares of peatlands have been drained now uh, for agriculture. That is a tiny fraction of total agricultural land. That produces about 2% of all human emissions. Not agricultural emissions, all human emissions. So about one per, less than 1% of total agricultural land is producing 2% of, em, of emissions because when you drain them, microorganisms come in and eat the soil and they put the carbon back in the atmosphere, and you get these large peat fires. And about half of that land is little used for agriculture. So some is used very intensively for agriculture, and some is just kind of left abandoned. And restoring that is one of the highest priorities that we can do right now. And the way you restore it is you basically block up the drainage ditches. Okay. A la okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about is reducing the production emissions. Now the production emissions are gonna be about nine gigatons. And they come, as I said, they come from these main sources. So this is the methane produced in the stomachs of, of ruminants, manure management, manure deposited on pasture, mostly urine, not, uh, fertilizer from the soils, and methane from rice. And it's hard to reduce, well, there are easy ways, or not easy ways, there are relatively basic management ways that can reduce those emissions somewhat but somewhat's not enough. <laughs> we need to reduce them a lot. So in the course of doing this report, there were times when I was basically ready to throw myself off a cliff, euthanize my children, uh, but w the thing that gave me hope was that amazingly, in every one of these areas, there are scientists with small budgets have come up with remarkably promising innovations. And uh, so there's now a compound that seems to reduce the methane from ruminants by about 30%. Uh, manure management is primarily a political challenge. Uh, manure is expensive, to, or is a, a big problem to deal with. It has a lot of nutrients, but it's bulky and whatever. But I did an estimate and discovered that the Cadillac version of controlling manure from pig farms would add about 2% to the cost of, of pork. And that, and and this manure has huge environmental problems, air pollution, water pollution, odors, even addition to the uh, climate emissions. And that is basically a question of just pushing things forward. That's just, right, we should have regular, that's a political failure that we allow these manure to be so badly managed around the world. But I want to talk a little bit about this. So nitrogen use, it's not just from the fertilizer, but even the nitrogen fixed by, uh, by nitrogen fixing uh, crops like soybeans, uh, is a big source of emissions, and it's a big source of water pollution and other kinds of air pollution. And if you need to produce 50% more food, more or less you're going to use 50% more nitrogen. And even if you increase the efficiency of that a lot and get back to pr the present condition, you still have massive pollution. So that means we need to increase the efficiency of nitrogen a lot, a lot. And that means you're going to need some innovations. Right now we put almost the entire burden on farmers. And it's challenging because the problem with nitrogen, if you study nitrogen at all, is the minute it's in the ground, it wants to go somewhere. <laughs> it turns into nitrate and it runs off before the crops need it.
And the key actually is keeping nitrogen in the form of ammonium uh, as long as possible before it turns into nitrate, which is when you lose it. So there are chemical compounds that you can add to fertilizer that do that, that have been around for 30 years, have been, the entire fertilizer industry uh, spends about a hundred, uh, what was it? It's, it's I think a hundred million dollars on um, uh, research globally, most of it for manufacturing. It's a tiny, it's less than 1% of their, of their budgets. They spend tiny, tiny fractions. They're a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. They spend no money on R&D. And they haven't developed these compounds. And there's also a, 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 a tiny group of scientists have discovered that plants themselves will exude chemicals in their roots that prevent ammonia, uh, ammonium from converting to nitrate and are trying to and discover that there are varieties of rice, um, corn, and wheat that also do that and are trying to breed that in. They have a budget of less than a million dollars a year. They discovered this 15 years ago and it has enormous promise. Uh, and the key point uh, that I want to make, on all, and there are varieties of rice that produce less methane. But no one's actually, I mean, a few scientists study it, no one's deliberately trying to move that along. So in each of these areas, you discover that there are really promising opportunities for innovation. So how do we make them happen? And, and, and also, the, the fertilizer manufacturing, the key there is the nitrogen, is, I'm sorry, is the hydrogen. Hydrogen, and everyone, you probably know that a nitrogen manufacturing uses a lot of energy, but 85% of that is produced hydrogen. So there's a lot of people working on ways of making hydrogen from solar, for example, that could tremendously reduce that. So what are the, what's the themes of this? I'm going to go back here. So we need three kinds of things. One is we need people to, for the things we know how to do, we need people actually doing the development work to do that. So for example, we know how to make better use of rice through water management. No one in the world is responsible for actually figuring out where you can do that and how. <laughs> there are some researchers kind of study the methane. No one's planning how to implement the management measures. Uh, there's, uh, we need more research funding, and we need what I call flexible regulation. Here's an example of a flexible regulation, what we propose, which would be to require that fertilizer companies uh, incorporate increasingly effective and increasing percentages of these compounds that help keep nitrogen in place over time shifting some of the burden from uh, farmers to fertilizer manufacturers and giving them an incentive to, to innovate and improve over time. And there's no way we're going to solve this problem without some regulations. Uh, and we need more money, but it also turns out that the world already spends about $600 billion a year on various forms of farm subsidies, and about three quarters of that have almost nothing to do with anything I've even by the wildest imagination of anything that I've talked about here. We pass farm bills every five years in the United States, billions of dollars in subsidies. And uh, one reason that happens is because uh, the people who, the congressmen who care about climate don't pay the tiniest bit of attention to the farm bill. And the next farm bill needs to be thought of as a climate bill. So that incentives, that money is used to push agriculture into dealing with some of these problems, many of which will be beneficial productivity gains. Okay, so these are some of my co-authors. Uh, I particularly want to talk about Patrice Dumas, who is the, the modeler uh, from CIRAD in France. And here's a summary, and I'll let you read the summary. But let me, let me kind of summarize in a few big points. At the end of the day, we became convinced that this is a problem that could be solved even cheaply if the world really tried to make it happen. Why? because so many things are beneficial by themselves, like educating girls in Africa, controlling manure. It turns out that these compounds that reduce nitrogen loss tend to boost yields. Uh, so many of things, these things have the opportunity to be, the way an economist would think about them, even free because of all of their alternative benefits. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is this gets a tiny, tiny fraction of the attention. And there's tremendous ideologies in the agricultural space and tremendous political challenges. Ideologies of all perspective, you know, a, a local farmer's market is the solution to all problems. Big farms are great, doesn't matter. You know, people on all sides, and I take a very pragmatic approach. This is a problem that the world 
if it doesn't solve, it will cook. And so part of the issue is just getting a lot more attention uh, and effort put into solving, into solving these issues. And so I, it's one of these things where I think we could probably solve the problem, uh, and the question is moving it forward. So thanks very much. And have to So just a couple of minutes for questions, I guess. So yes. So the it, it, so um, the qu the question is: Does the our estimates of productivity gains and yields deal with the different kind of yield growth in different countries? And the answer is yes. Uh, uh, the um, but that's part of the challenge. So one of the things that people don't often realize in the challenge is we are going to produce more food in developing countries. And the reason for that is that's where the population growth is. There are two reasons for that. One is that's where the population growth is. And the second is as developing countries develop, they will become more competitive globally. Because that's basically, more or less, agriculture follows economic development, and, or it leads, but also follows in terms of its efficiencies. Now that's good in the sense that they will gain uh, yield, they will improve their yields and their productivities and efficiencies. But when you shift food production from a highly efficient country to a developing country, you are reducing the global average efficiency even if the developing country is increasing in its efficiency. Uh, so, so if, for example, if uh, I saw some confusion there. Uh, if you're, if you know, um, well, I just want to say about it. If you're producing more food, if you're at ten, if you're at ten tons in the U.S. of corn per hectare, and you're at you know three tons or two tons in Africa, and you shift production to Africa, even if Africa doubles its yield to four tons, you're still going to have lower global yield. Uh, and so, yes, we, the answer is yes. We we do take account of that. There's there is. You know, large potential for yield growth in many developing countries, but you still, that doesn't, just wishing it doesn't make it happen. Okay. That's all the questions we'll have time for right now. Thank you so much. This was terrific. I learned an incredible amount.